Hello and welcome back to the Jack Calisthenics podcast where we're going to talk about calisthenics, get into it and demystify some of the tricky stuff about calisthenics training. So today we're going to talk about the mechanics of the planche, the grip, the training for it, common mistakes people make and today with me I have a high level calisthenics athlete that is, you've probably seen him before, he has a really nice looking planche and his name's Mr. Wong so yeah would you like to introduce yourself to the people? Yo what's up guys, it's Mr. Wong right here, also known as Marcus Wong. I'm a calisthenic expert in planche, I specialize specifically in planche because it's such a cool movement it's the, it can be done everywhere and like there's so much intricacy in the planche you know it's a very complex movement and today I'm going to talk more about it thanks for coming on man yes yeah, so I've wanted to do this conversation for a long time we're gonna dive straight into it but I had to say this because yeah I feel like you know a lot about the planche a lot about the grip and the specifics that a lot of people don't mention I think I had a quick look on YouTube about you know planche grip I looked, there's not many videos on it, not many people talk about it, so yeah, I think it'll be some good information for people. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's dive straight into it. So, the first thing is, so, uh, what is the correct activation for plants, just in general, and what would you say is the correct grip? All right, so, for the correct activation, is basically recruiting as many muscles as you can when you perform the planche. So, mainly, when you perform the planche, you want to really activate your delts and how to do that is by extending rolling your shoulders out that way you can feel the flexion of the shoulders as you roll out so all you have to do is just bring your shoulders forward you can create some kind of like hollowness between the chest and there you go you got your shoulder activation next thing is just scapular protraction you don't want to spinal flex you know there's a difference between spinal flex and being in a neutral spine position while just protracting. I am simply bringing my shoulders forward by engaging the serratus right here to pull the scapula forward. So there you go. I have my shoulders activated. My scapula is activated through the serratus and I have my protraction right there. So what that is what I call a correct activation where you just simply use the right muscles to engage in the planche. So um, in terms of the grip, I see that this is really something that's uh, not spoken about by many athletes mm -hmm. is the grip. I see a lot of people, they have kind of a broken grip where whenever you grab the bar, you either collapse your wrist by breaking it like this or you kind of lose it like you lean a bit forward mm -hmm. and those have a lot of uh, detrimental consequences in the optimization of planche. So the grip is very important because you want to maintain height between the ground and your body. The more height you have, the easier it is to perform a lot of dynamic movements such as the push-up or the press. Um, so the grip is, uh, is very, it's a very small detail that you have to understand. If you have a broken grip, you are basically reducing the point of contact of your hand, your palm with the bar and that kind of loses a lot of grip strength which is very important when you really want to elevate yourself. And so when you kind of lean a bit too forward, you're going to activate the anterior chain of the arm. That means the more of mm -hmm. the biceps, the forearms and the shoulders. Um, and then you, what's going to happen is you end up leaning and plunging down even more and that's when you lose height and elevation and it just makes uh, all the dynamic movements way harder to perform because if you think about it you're leaning like this you're closing the angle it's hard to do a push-up doing like this or even press especially a press when you're already disengaged it's going to take a very long motion to go all the way mm -hmm. up to a handstand compared to when you have a right grip which is by placing the force around here, the back of your palm, you are engaging the posterior chain of the arm. So that's more on the tricep, the extensors right here, or the flexors, both. And uh, on the posterior delts, which also connects to the lats and the terrace right here. That way, you have height, you know. You're creating mm -hmm. an angle for elevation, and that helps you with easy range of motion when you have that elevation, which is through also like the, the help of protraction. Mm -hmm. So yeah. 
Okay, okay. Thank you for that. That was super detailed. So yeah, I really want to dive into the details of it. So if you want to keep going, if you want to go even more into detail, feel free to. I'm going to go back to the planche activation. So the first thing you said was number one, the shoulders. So presenting those shoulders forward. So those are in front. Um, so those are the main things about the shoulders. Is there anything else people need to think about the rest of the body? So let's talk more about full planche. So let's leave the other pr progressions for now. Let's just talk about full planche to make it a bit more simple. Um, yeah, is there anything they should be thinking about the core and anything below? Um, yeah, do you, do you want to explain that a bit more? So I feel like getting the protraction, so the, the planche is usually separated into the upper torso and the lower torso. The upper torso is much more easier in terms of activation because all you need to know is the cue of presenting, protracting, and there you go. But the lower body is where pe most people struggle at um, as it's kind of further down away from the body. So you kind of not have more mind to muscle connection since it's a bit lower and you kind of get disorientated using your arms and both your lower body. So I feel like the lower body is quite important in terms of the cues and activation as most people when they go into a straddle or a full, they don't engage their glutes. When they don't mm -hmm. engage their glutes, they kind of break the connection between the upper trunk and the lower trunk and that way they'll end up in a pike. So it's really important when you want to perform a nice clean planche to activate your glutes so that you can extend out nicely, forming a nice straight line. <laughs> yeah, I fully agree. Like one of the first things, especially when I'm coaching people on planche and particularly straddle planche, that's when the kind of the first time people are really needing to activate their glutes. And as guys, you're not really using a lot of glutes and a lot of other exercises or guys don't train their glutes super hard. So usually it's a really weird feeling that people aren't used to as well. So yeah. that's the first thing I see is that even, even the, sh the shoulders are usually quite strong. Um, obviously they need to get them even stronger to you know work towards that full planche. But yeah, it's the glutes that are lacking e e even more that you kind of need to, okay, you've done your tuck progressions, but now you're finally starting to use the glutes like um, to a larger degree. Um, yes. So I like that. It, is there anything um, pelvis position, anything like that people need to think of or do they just really need to focus on the glutes? Is that the main uh, aspect of the lower body? So you need to activate PPT, also known as posterior pelvic tilt. And that's usually uh, done by engaging the glutes. And another factor of engaging PPT is um, extending the hip flexors. So if you can see right here, my hips right now are in a neutral position. So when you squeeze your glutes, your body will automatically pull the pelvis backwards and that would extend the hip flexors, leaving like a straight line for the extension of the lower body. So it's more of like thrusting your hips forward. You want to thrust yeah. your hips forward while squeezing the glutes to kind of twist, getting that torque in the hips to extend out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so perfect. Yeah, that's, that's, li that's literally what I say. Thinking. Yeah, I literally tell people like when they're doing planche leans, I notice like a lot of people have their hips, like the height of their shoulders or even higher sometimes. Yes. Literally like, like just thrust the, the ground, like it'll look weird or feel weird, but just like literally just thrust against the ground, squeeze mm -hmm. your glutes, thrust towards the ground. Yes. Okay, and, let's... Uh, also, yeah, another good. thing I want to add is squeezing the quads as well. Because once you mm -hmm. squeeze the glutes and you extend it, your hips, now you need to lock it and create tension and that's uh, through engaging the quads where you kind of really firmly s squeeze the legs together and maintaining that straight line mm -hmm. so the quads yeah. are also pretty important mm. yeah that, that's something even yeah i need to like constantly think about it, is like the quads um because I feel like it's kind of more natural for me to do it in front leg, but sometimes in the planche, like you said, you can get disorientated. You're trying to press, trying to push up, you're trying to hold, trying to keep your shoulder position. You kind of forget about the quads. They're like very tertiary or even like less on the list of, or on things you're thinking about, but it's all important. Yep. But to go back to the grip, 
um, because one of the whole reasons I wanted to have this conversation is because you kind of brought this to my attention when, uh, if you guys don't know, Mr. Wong does uh, personal training or calisthenics coaching. Um, he did it online. I don't know if you're still doing it, um, but you can tell the people about that. But he was coaching one of my friends now that trains the same gym I oh, do. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think he showed you one of my planches and the first thing you mentioned was uh, my grip. And that's when I, like, I never really paid, I, I mean, I paid attention to it, like um, trying to get as much contact with the bar as possible. Um, but that's when I really started thinking about it more um, and realizing how big a play it was having. And it makes sense because it's the contact between you and the thing you're putting your force into, um, which is whatever surface you're using. And in my case, it was uh, peed bars. So um, yeah, I, I think for me, yeah, it was something to do with like the, the back of the hand was maybe coming up in that planch. Um, but is there any common things you see people doing that's wrong uh, with the with the grip? Is there like super common problems that you can kind of go over and let the people know so they're aware of it? Well. One of the most common problems I see when people perform planche, especially with the, the, on the grip aspect, is that they don't grip the ball hard enough. So they just kind of have a loose grip. And if they don't have a firm grip, you're going to kind of lose a lot of strength in terms of controlling. Because let's say you're holding the bar like this and you have a very firm grip. The bar is going to mm -hmm. be moved with you. So it's going to be like part of you right now. But if you have a loose grip, the bar is not going to be one with the body. And that way you can't really apply strength. Because now you, there's so many ways you, get, you, but you can fall forward, fall backwards. Usually you will fall forward. That's the consequences of like leaning forward from the planche. And you don't have a grip. And that way you, you are going to be resisting the planche instead of putting strength into performing the planche. So there's mm -hmm. two very big difference uh, when doing the planche is one, resisting the planche or you are exerting force to perform the planche. Um, one of the most common things that for resisting is, let's say, Maltese. You know, it's hard to protract and maintain that elevation when you do Maltese. What I see a lot mm -hmm. of people do is they kind of resist Maltese and they sink into it. So that yeah. way, it's kind of like, it's hurting the body because you are not fighting against gravity by applying a force, but you're letting gravity bring you down. And that's the same concept as the plunge. When you lose your grip and you lean forward, you kind of lose and, re and get, you kind of like lose that opposite force, the counteractive force. And now you're just gonna be leaning, and it's gonna be hard doing a lot of different movements. Yeah, yeah, I, I fully agree with that, and yeah, I've kind of experienced that, um, and I see it a lot. It's kind of when you know you kind of lose that elevation, that height, and it's kind of due to you losing a bit of strength in the shoulders. You, some people lean a lot forward, uh, rely on the wrists um, rather than the strength. So it's just like you said. I like the way you put it. Is um, resisting the planche so they're just kind of resisting falling and they're no longer putting strength into the planche um, yes. which is when it kind of gets trickier you're relying a bit more on just wrist strength and, and wrist compression rather than your actual elevation in like muscles like the serratus your shoulders your protraction all the things yes. that give you the height hmm. so I, I wanted to talk a bit more about elevation um, but yeah I guess first we'll, we'll talk about grip elevation so you mentioned before, I think, that you want to put pressure or push through the back of your palm. Yes. Um, so you're going to have the bar resting across here. So I have the bar between my index finger and thumb right. running across here. And I'm trying to maintain that contact at the back of my palm. But the yes. thing I've been playing around with is pulling with my pinky to activate um, this posterior part of my forearm. Yes. And yeah, I'm, I'm trying to play around with that, but I'm, I'm not sure exactly what is technically correct. I've just been playing around with it and pushing. So what mm -hmm. would you say is a good way to use that back of your hand here? Is it squeezing the pinky? Is it trying to pull with the pinky? Or is it just pushing with the palm? So it's more of a combination of pulling with not just the pinky, but the ring finger as well, that this part is usually where you want to have most contact on. So this three fingers right here, you want to really like squeeze the bar and that's when you push through the palm 
right here through mm. on a ra radio deviation. I think mm. I might be incorrect. I, I think that I think that's the right one. Yeah. So you're gonna radio deviate. That way you're gonna apply pressure right there. That's gonna be your torque right there. And then you're gonna pull with the hands, and then try to maintain that grip, being as firm as possible. That way you can fully engage the entire forearm, because now mm -hmm. you're using your flexes, you're squeezing, you're engaging, you're extending out, your extensors are stabilizing the forearm, and then through that engagement, you can finally use the um, the triceps and the lats to stabilize this part right here, the rotator cuff mm -hmm. region, and that mm -hmm. way you can really maintain that height if you push from the back of the palm. Because if you start going on the far front of the palm right here, that this is what's going to happen. You're going to kind of retract, lose that height, lean forward, come into a dead planche, and it's going to be hard to re-protract and engage. Because you don't see anybody that has good elevation kind of lean on the front of their palm because it's not optimal. Those that does mm -hmm. it, it's either like they're very strong because of the genetics and stuff like that. But in terms mm -hmm. of optimization, the back of the palm is where you need to apply force at. Yeah, oh, th that was it. Yeah, I, you, you, what you were saying just reminded me. Yeah, because I remember in my punch, I was getting a couple seconds of good elevation and height and protraction. And then I would slowly, I wouldn't even lose protraction at that point. It'd be like, I'd be high, elevate for one, two seconds. Then I would keep my protraction, but I would be dropping and losing that angle. And yeah, and it was coming from uh, partially my grip, um, partially mm -hmm. some other weaknesses here, which I've worked on, like, I think it was earlier this year, which has helped a lot. Um, in my holds, in my presses, and now I'm working on presses more, so it's all helping, like you said, the elevation, that height. Yes. Kind of making presses a lot easier uh, and yes. all of that. Yeah, do you want to add to that? Uh, so, yeah, it's really important for the grip in terms of the presses because presses are mainly uh, made easier through the elevation of plunge. So the higher you are, the easier it is for you to engage that shoulder flexion to pull up into a handstand because by leaning more and more forward you are now bringing your shoulders into an extended position and that mm -hmm. is going to be very hard to really engage and press up compared to doing this going up so for the viewers you can try pressing up retract your shoulders and do this like retract force put force on your shoulders and try to bring your arms up compared to extending your arms out and press up. There's a huge difference when you do that. <laughs> okay, right. Uh, I, I think I might ask a few more questions about presses, but we're going to try and stick to the grip. So overall, to kind of go over that again, so you're squeezing with these kind of last three fingers, the pinky yes. ring at the middle, and then you're also pushing with the palm, making sure that's in contact to engage this side, the posterior side of the arm, and then to help with the whole chain activating the lats and giving you that height. Is that right? Yes, okay. that is correct. Perfect. All right, um, to move on to that, so we're talking about grip, all of that wrist. So wrist comes into it, you know, wrist flexibility, stuff like that. So a lot of people when they're starting out with planche, they will, you know, start using wrist wraps because, you know, they'll be learning handstands and, yes. you know, you know, you know the, we've all been there, the, the wrists start hurting and the forearms as well. Um, yeah, yeah. So what are your thoughts on, on wrist wraps? Um, do you think people should be using them? And if so, when should they use them? When should they not use them? So, wrist wraps was a thing that um, I used to use a lot when I first started, just because of the, the extra support and like how it's, it get, makes me more comfortable when performing the plunge. But in the long run, uh, I would advise not to always use wrist wraps because by having that external support the entire time, you are not directly conditioning your wrist as much as it should be. So once you take that off, your wrist is not as strong as it's supposed to be when you train without the wrist wraps. I would say you want to use a wrist, the wrist wraps as some sort of like accessory uh, when you're like trying to train really hard and you need that extra support. 
or just in competitions when you want everything to be very stable, all hot and compressed and stuff like that. But in your general training, don't use wrist wraps because it's kind of counterintuitive to not train and condition your wrist over the long run. Um, but if you do feel pain and you do need that extra support, you can use wrist wraps. But if you don't think it's, I don't think it's really necessary if there's no pain or like you just like starting to get into the plunge and you need that little bit of conditioning because you know, you gotta go through the pain to mm -hmm. really adapt and overcome it. Yeah, I, yeah, 100%. I, I've kind of agreed. I've kind of slowly started moving towards um, that kind of thing, or, or staying away from the wrist wraps rather than, you know, every session kind of thing. Um, yeah, for me and what kind I, I advise is pretty much the same thing is, yeah, not to rely on them. Because I, I feel like people start relying on them and they feel like, oh, my wrists are safe when I use them, which, like you said, is kind of counterintuitive. You're not conditioning your wrists. Um, so I kind of see it in the same way I see elbow sleeves. A lot of people ask me about elbow sleeves is should I use them? Should I not? I'll be like, yeah, for hard sets or when you feel a slight strain or maybe one side or, or something like that. Um, obviously you're not feeling pain or anything. You just want to stay safe for that one hard set or something. Maybe you're doing cross. You're just, you know, you want to be as safe as you can yes. for one, two sets mm -hmm. because you're pushing a bit harder that day. Then yeah, use it, but don't rely on it. Um, yeah, uh, that's kind of how I feel. And then I, I feel like people get into also like a, a like a loop like okay my foot i've got forearm pain i've got wrist pain let me use the wrist wraps they push hard because they have the wrist wraps on um and then your wrist isn't getting better so you keep using the, the wrist wraps and then you keep training and then it's not getting better you keep using the wrist wraps you tighten it yeah, even yeah, harder yeah. <laughs> and it gets weaker and it keeps going so i feel like yeah that's yes. a cycle i've got been in before um, mm -hmm. and a lot of people get into yeah so. that's a pretty vicious cycle right there because when you think that you are putting support you're, you're you're able to push harder and like you're not really conditioning your wrist throughout this entire process you know and it just keeps happening and some people just never never figure it out and they're like oh i got wrist pain maybe i'm not suited for calisthenics is you're lacking the conditioning that you should mm -hmm. be doing but not with support all the time yeah and uh, that is one of the most like kind of profound things that I kind of figured out was because my forearm pain was holding me back so much because like my shoulders were fine and strong and I could push the sets but you know it's the forearms the wrist that would give out for me it was forearm pain um, and when I eventually you know conditioned my forearms I, first I had to give them time to heal uh, and then got them better and then strengthened them first without using wrist wraps I spent a period just training plant without wrist wraps and it was uncomfortable at first it wasn't like extremely painful so I was trying to stay away from extreme pain it was just uncomfortable for a while, but my body got used to it. And now I only really get forearm pain when I'm doing it like heavy, heavy sets, like constantly or pushing quite hard. And you know, that's when I'll try and, you know, either I, I know then I need to tone it down or I need to do a bit more for my wrist and forearms. But yeah, to yeah. talk about that a bit more, um, because we were talking about um, the grip and, you know, making sure you have a good grip on the bar. So. Is there any exercises or stretches you would advise to start getting used to that kind of grip and activating this side of the forearm? Is there anything you use or any exercises? Mm. Like that? Uh, I mean, that's more of like the way to activate. So it's more of a cue that you can start applying on. Uh, the simplest way to try to, when starting to learn that grip is simply a planche lean on the floor with your P-bars. You just want to lean lean and make sure that your grip is pushed backwards. So that way your body will start to learn in the most simplest and low intensity exercise, which is like a planche lean. You're going to start understanding the way to do that. Uh, another thing is wrist mobility. So you want to like always stretch out the wrist, make it comfortable so that it's, it's in within its normal range. Cause usually when you stretch, it's going to go just a bit, but that is enough, you know? So mm -hmm. it's more of wrist mobility and practicing it with low intensity skills. Then gradually yeah. you can kind of slowly apply it onto a tuck, straddle, and eventually a full. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. That makes sense. Um, okay. Let's move on from the wrist wraps. Um, so yeah, do you, I mean, to be fair, I was going to ask, like, do you have any cues for 
you know, learning this correct form, like all the things you said, the shoulders, um, the hip position, the glutes, but to be fair, all of it is quite self-explanatory, but is, is there any cues you know that made it really click for you, especially the hollow body, I feel like a lot of people, mm -hmm. the protraction on the hollow body is made the hardest thing, but once it clicks, it clicks. Is there anything that helped you with any of those kind of things? Um, one thing I would like to imagine is when you round your shoulders, you kind of create a hollow line, like a half circle, a half dome mm -hmm. between your shoulders. So mm -hmm. there should be some kind of like space between the shoulders. That way you yeah. know that you're really engaging the shoulders right there and reach out. When you reach out, you want to feel a stretch around the rhomboids area to know that you are really protracting. So you can look at the mirror. The mirror is one of the best ways to practice engagement because you can literally look at the mirror, practice and look at, oh, what am I engaging? What am I disengaging? And it's very easy to adjust, especially when you're standing up. Um, another good way to learn the engagement, simply using a band. You can loop the band around your lower back right here and then just kind of hold it between your arms and do a protraction. Hold that and look at what is being engaged and what is not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's, that sounds really good. Yeah, for, for me, I pretty much did the second method. I used a heavier band till I could feel the activation because I wasn't strong enough to do it. You know, like say I was learning straddle planche and my activation wasn't good. I wasn't strong enough to do it in my unassisted hold, so I had to add a band. So I think that's a good mm -hmm. method of, uh, of doing it. Yeah. Um, so for increasing form, is there any way you would advise doing this? Is there a certain method you would use? So let's say someone has a bad form full planche. They just started learning it. How would you suggest that they increase the form? Just keep doing attempts of it or, you know, like you said, use the bands. Um, yeah, what way would you kind of say is the best way to start slowly increasing their form? So when you first unlock the planche, even if it's bad form, the first thing is always to build volume. So I'm pretty sure this training concept has been like going around everywhere in the calisthenic community of how you want to build volume and intensity. This was created by Valentin, Valentin LTZ. Uh, it's a very great and logical method that um, I've seen a lot of people use it. I've seen a lot of people do it. I myself done it. Uh, it's been showing great results. So even when you first enter a bad form planche, you always want to build volume. So think of it as a pyramid, you know? You can't build the top of the pyramid without the base, which is large. That's your volume. There's no way a pyramid can stand if it's like, kind of like this. Mm -hmm. The bigger the base, the easier it is to build to the top. And that base, that foundation, is built through volume. So let's say you have a three second bat full planche you should not even think of going into like a cleaning it into a nice full plunge because it's just not it's, it, it doesn't make sense that you can kind of clean it and hold a three second without progressing fast so you want to kind of try to do the plunge even if it's dirty as long as it's not too shitty as long as you're not losing the engagement you're having the right activation the form does not really matter in terms of visual cue. So you just want to work on that base. Maybe get into like 7-8 seconds of bad plunge, bad form. And once you have that big volume, you can now clean it, mold it, chisel it into a 3 second clean full plunge. Because now you have the base, you have that mountain right now. All you have to do, chisel away, mold it into that pyramid. That, that molding, is by uh, training intensity or form. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, I really like that analogy um, of, of the pyramid and this idea of building volume. This is something I, I didn't, uh, yeah, I came, came across it by reading like some strength, um, uh, I like I think I was just reading about on, on just literally just building strength and it wasn't, it was like weightlifting. Um, and mm -hmm. that's literally what they do in weightlifting. So I think this is like a principle that most kind of strength sports they'll utilize or kind of build a large amount of volume. Like, you know, anyone that's lifting weights, um, you don't just bench your one rep max every week. You're usually doing, making it easier, doing a ton of reps, and then you're kind of tapering down to sort of 
build up to a new mat in terms of high intensity you're now lifting more weight so you build that volume first then you kind of clean up and you know work on your max for a little bit whatever period of time it is depending on the sport etc and your mm -hmm. your level um so yeah that's one method but would you say this applies to you know other variations of planch such as the presses the push-ups would you say it works the same way build the volume do it you know slightly worse form or just do it with bands a lot of reps until you can kind of start working more intensely yes so um you want to be training for specificity so what that means is if you want to train you want to get good at the planche i mean the press you solely train on the press itself and uh build volume in the presses because the more volume you have the easier it is to execute one proper press and so that volume will be shaped into a good looking press a uh, good looking nice intensity eventually so mm -hmm. a good way to train is through combinations you know because in combinations you kind of train the presses the push the holds and having a big volume on that eventually will give you a pretty easy like nice simple set like a push press and then hold yeah yeah i, I fully agree with that um yeah one thing i was gonna ask or one question that i had is and i've heard a lot is for push-ups um the activation with that uh, this is kind of a tangent, but would you say for the activation for it, how do you keep your form? Do you end up a little bit neutral at the bottom? Do you keep your full protraction at the bottom as much as you can? So for the activation for push-ups, um, when people are trying to you know, get as clean as they can with it, how would you say is the correct way to do so? Mm, so the push-up is also a pretty interesting thing uh, not many people talk about. The push-up is very trajectory-based. So right here. I see a lot of people, usually the common mistakes when you do push-ups is when you go down, you push out and extend out like this. That way, you immediately lose that height, you're now leaning forward, and you barely, you can barely extend your arms already. So most people will come down like this, and go like, like that. That's like the start, um, it's fine, it's normal, so you want to kind of drill on learning the proper trajectory going down and up like this so when you go down make sure you always have your again the grip applying mm -hmm. pressure at the back of the palm so that when you go down you kind of keep that protraction squeeze the muscles right here so it's usually the lats and the terrace uh, mainly the terrace minor because that helps with uh, shoulder external rotation of the shoulder and like shoulder uh extension so squeezing those muscles right here mm -hmm. is to help you stabilize in the 90 degree position here and you see how my arms are in a 90 degree position that way you get the full uh, engagement of the pecs the shoulders and the lats the terrace right here to mm -hmm. stabilize yourself and once you want to go back up, simply push from the back of the palm. You want to feel like you're punching something. So you want to punch up, re-engage everything at that one point. It's like utilizing the momentum of when you explode back up, mm -hmm. kind of re-protract at that point. So that way, mm -hmm. you see how my, my forearm will travel in one plane only. So mm -hmm. it's just coming like this, instead of here. That way mm -hmm. you're gonna fall. But if you do back, do this motion right here, you're gonna re-engage and maintain that height elevation. You can see how much height I have between mm -hmm. my chest and my palm compared to this. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I really like that because I feel like a lot of people don't talk about like they talk about the basics of punch push-ups, like just have the progressions and stuff, but not like specifically those things we just mentioned that we're, we're going to go into. Um, yeah, for me myself, like like you said, so keeping the position, um, I really think about presenting my shoulders and even at the bottom, keeping them forward. That really helps me. So I just keep keep them forward at the bottom because I think like a, a one mistake I see a lot of people do is at the bottom they kind of end up in like 
Like maybe Retru they've tried a, a bent arm. Yeah. yeah, maybe they've tried yeah a bent arm planche before as a beginner, and there you're not trying to protract. Um, so they're kind of in that habit already that when they do the planche push up, they just retract and they're just holding a straight line, and then obviously it's then you know like ten times harder to kind of push up and regain that protraction like you said. Yes. So yeah, yeah. I literally had someone asking me today, and I said just keep the shoulders forward. I'm not even really thinking about protraction when I'm going down. I'm thinking about my shoulders and kind of keeping this hollow body and pressing downwards like this mm -hmm. and then back up as much as I can. But the hardest bit for me and I guess with my, most people is going to be regaining that retraction at the top of the push up. Do you have any advice for that activation and helping people with that? So they've gone down, they've maintained that activation as much as they can. They're now pushing up and they're trying to hold the protraction at the top. Do you have any advice for that? Um so for that you want to work on two different things one obviously the band the band is going to help you a lot especially but you really need to think about it when you re-engage you want to re-protract and maintain the height and use the band's momentum so you kind of have to feel it to understand when to carry up and push bringing yourself up to re-engage everything at once um the second method that i used that was pretty common was like um, just doing simple pseudo push-ups on the ground and just kind of exploding up holding that protraction once and then coming back down so that mm -hmm. way you're gonna teach your body to go the full extension right there going down and up really regaining that protraction on the top on a low intensity exercise that's a, a, quite a good way to teach your body and how to maintain mm -hmm. that height on the top yeah because okay. that height yeah. on the top is mm -hmm. uh, mainly due to serratus anterior activation because once you're all the way on the top there your serratus is I would say the fastest to fatigue out of all the prime movers of the, of the plunge so mm -hmm. it's really important to bring that momentum together with you so that it's easier to re-engage the serratus and enter protraction. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I feel like that's the same with me. The first thing to go, yeah, is that serratus there. And then, yeah, if anything, then maybe it's my protraction and my, my shoulders last. Um, yeah. Even, yeah, going back to something else you said is the, the timing of the push-up. I feel like, especially when you can do multiple reps or if you're using a band to do multiple reps, you can see there's a real almost like pattern to when you need to push um, and obviously if you're doing deep ones it sort of changes but there's a real kind of reflex from the, the stretch you get um, yes. to push and you can really make use of that to get a lot of explosive power but of course then still the hardest bit is holding at the top. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's true. Oh. Is the best way to progress from tuck variations uh, to straddle and then bridge those gaps? Um, or, or would you say you've covered that with, you know, some of the other stuff you talked about with building volume? Uh, yes, again, it's kind of like, as I mentioned before, about building volume. From going from a tuck to a straddle is basically you want to bring, build that volume up. Of course, attempt. It's very important to introduce your body to a new variation with the band so that your body starts to learn and adapt to, okay, so now this is what I need to do instead of always keeping it tucked in because a tuck to a straddle it's a whole different activation because when you're in a tuck only the upper body you're not engaging the lower body whatsoever but as you go into a straddle you're gonna extend the hips out you're gonna have to squeeze your glutes squeeze your quads point your toes maintain tension keeping that line and I guess it just gets significantly more complex going from a tuck to a straddle so you want to use a band for that and also it's also like building volume for a straddle to a full i think it's much easier it's just more taxing on the shoulders because you're closing it you're putting more pressure in a in a condensed space right now compared to like when you spread out the weight now it's all focused and your shoulders have to be strong mm -hmm. for that so it's more of like the shoulders and the serratus from going from a straddle to full, but from tuck 
to straddle is more of the engagement where you need to use the bands. Yeah, a hundred percent. I agree. Like from straddle to full, literally. Yeah, I feel like it's mostly just, you've got the act. If you've got a clean straddle, you've got the activation. Like oh, your glutes are almost. It's harder like to squeeze your glutes when you, when your glutes are straddled like that and yes. keep them in a nice position. Um, compared to full, which is why a lot of people, you know, will say, oh, full is actually easier than the straddles because your your glutes literally have to activate a bit less. It's much easier when those legs yes. are together already, and with pointing the toes. Um, so the leg activation is almost easier. So almost that lower body is easy in terms of like mentally thinking on the form. But then it, yeah, it's a shoulder strength obviously because there's more mm -hmm. body weight centered. Um, but yeah, I think that's a good basis for everyone to progress from from each progression. Um, but I just had one more question about planche presses. Um, so yes. I hate planche presses <laughs> so much, and yeah, I don't know why. Maybe yeah, maybe it's just something about I'm just what, naturally way better uh, at push push ups. But that's just because I've done them more. Mm -hmm. um, so now I'm trying to do planche presses more. But what would you say is some good sort of I guess not cues or techniques, but like for some people, they say, you know, tuck your head or nod your head down um, before you engage the press and that can help. Is there anything like that you would say um, is good and help you get more reps of presses or anything? Okay, so uh, there's actually a lot of cues for it, but I'm not going to share everything. I'm going to give one really like uh, useful cue in oh, terms yeah. of presses is breath work. So you need to learn how to exhale and inhale when you engage the press. So when you're in the planche, you're breathing normally, right? Everything's not tense. But as soon as you engage the press, you want to release that tension by exhaling. So it's, it's not like, no wait, actually, it's both releasing and getting tension. So by releasing mm -hmm. tension, you are exhaling when you exhale, your muscle relaxes. But if mm -hmm. you exhale forcefully, like quickly, you're gonna relax and tense it in a split second. And using that split second, you're gonna really engage and pump up that press. Because most people, when they get stuck halfway, they kind of hold their breath and there's so much tension. That's when you need to exhale to relax and bring up your shoulders because if you hold it like this and you feel a lot of tension you can try it out if you hold it like this it's really hard to go mm -hmm. up but if you just exhale you will feel that release and so breath work is a very important cue in terms of engaging executing the presses okay okay yeah i, I need to try that that's not something i've messed up about with is yeah that forceful push out i'll just yeah I, I think i usually just i'm kind of breathing like that if i'm doing like yeah dynamic work but i'll try i'll, I'll, I'll give that a try yeah yes, yes. That. not not yeah. many people like talk about the breath work and that's yeah. why i'm saying like the planche is so much intricacy uh <laughs> intrinsic so many, man. properties you know there's so many things that you gotta know so many things that you can do so many little cues and it's it's overall just a very interesting movement that I am dove very deep into. Yeah, okay. Uh, I got a lot, one last question and then we can go to anything you want to talk about. If not, we'll <coughs> close it out here. But my yeah, last yeah. question was, for building volume, do you prefer like to use a progression or like, you know, say slightly worse form progression, so no bands, um, or using bands to build volume which one do you kind of lean towards or do you feel like one's better than the other yeah what are your thoughts on that um i would say i would go with no bands because at the end of the day it's more of neuro adaptation so when you do it with the bands your body kind of reacts differently and it learns differently so it's very sciencey from this point out but it's more like how the body reacts and adapts depending on the different intensities and uh, platforms you use. So let's say the band. Once you have the band, your extension is kind of like disrupted as well because you have a force pulling you upwards. That force is not, I would say, bad, but it's just a different kind of feeling you have. 
mm-hmm. when you do like uh, without the band and with the band. So let's say mm-hmm. a press. A press would be so easy with a band because you already have that upward force to literally bring you up compared to doing it without the band where you really have to engage your shoulders, open up the shoulders and stuff like that. It's it's not completely different, but there is a bit of difference in the terms of execution. So you want to really adapt. You want to really push your body to the direction of adapt. You want to direct your body towards more of like without the bands so that you can perform better in the long run because your body is just going to adapt to, okay, you know, I don't need the band. I can just start training without the bands and like just kind of build volume from there on. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's more specific at this point because mm-hmm. now you're training without band instead of a band. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I hope that wasn't too confusing. I don't think I no, trained I'm... it very well, but... I think it makes uh, sense. That's, that's kind of the gist of it, you know? Yeah. Okay, the, the, my one counter is, you know, would you say like if, if you're doing it without a band and you're using like worse form or you're, you haven't got that perfect form yet, for things like presses and stuff, uh, I feel like maybe it might be so hard for you to get the elevation. Um, yeah, what, yeah, what would you say to that? Because yeah, I feel like if you use worse form, then your elevation's worse, then you're learning the presses with worse form and obviously the aim is to slowly try and get the grip better get your elevation better work on that mm-hmm. especially with easier exercises and probably that's when you throw the bands in as like a supplementary exercise um but yeah what would you say to that would you just say okay yeah that's when you would use the band as a second exercise sort of thing i would say use the bands as a sort of like a refinement tool the bands is to refine your technique your activation because you have that support right now why not just focus on refining the way you execute the plunge? And for what I said just now, like training without the bands, that's more on the advanced level when you are already like, let's say having a 3D3, at yeah. that point you can already build volume without the band. Um, but before anything before that, the band is very helpful to build volume. But for me personally, I use the band on refinement, getting that nice, activation and understanding the technical details when performing a push or a press because you have so much more time to think what to engage and what to like just the way of execution the trajectory everything uh, the breath work so the band is a refinement tool for me and with that yeah that's the end of my questions uh do you have anything else you want to talk about in terms of grip mechanics of the planche anything like that um i would add I would say, one, one thing I would like to tell the viewers is to mm-hmm. work on good form in the long run. Even if you have shit form right now, try eventually, maybe after like a few weeks of training volume, go work on your form because it is very, very important. And for me, I preach to like train calisthenics for longevity and doing bad form is kind of going to mess you up in the long run because you're not engaging the muscles your muscles are slowly getting worn down by resisting gravity especially for those that does Maltese if you resist you're just gonna strain your pack and you're gonna have like all sorts of like injuries and injuries are not fun when you do calisthenics and Mm -hmm. I've been injury free for a very long time now because I've been very careful with the things I do and especially on working on form the number one way you get injuries or most people get injuries is resisting the force, you know. Your body's mm-hmm. in an unnatural position and you still want to force it to be in that position when you're resisting and that way you're going to get tear, tears and, you know, strains and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And in the long run, it's bad. Look at gymnast. I hate to say this, I think it's a controversial topic, but... Um, yeah. <laughs> Gymnasts don't really work on their form and look at the pro gymnasts once they retire out of their prime They get injuries here there and it's like they can't do what they used to do And that Mm -hmm. is not good in the long run. I've seen this. I made comparison and I'm like, yeah I do not want to be like all messed up and like pain here there 
having problems with my ligaments and tendons when I'm like 30 or 40. So work on form, condition your body correctly, and you will be able to do it in the long run. You can even do a planche when you're a grandpa. I can see myself doing that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what we all want to be doing. We all want to be planching when we're like 40, 50. Yeah, yeah. Okay, man. Yeah, um, yeah, to end this out, yeah, I completely agree with all of that, the longevity, and I just want to bring back to a phrase you said right at the start of this conversation, which was to, you know, try not to resist the planche, try and put your strength into it rather than resisting. That's something that, you know, I'm going to try and do moving forward, try and remember that. And something I notice, I, I notice in my strongest holds, I'm putting my, my strength into the bars, I'm not resisting falling. Um, maybe that's more like when I'm trying something very, very hard, but I know I'm making that progress when, you know, I get those days where I feel like my, my strengths are going into the bars and I'm not resisting. Uh, it's not just going all to my wrist. I'm not going into that dead planche. So yeah, thanks very much for your time, man. Um, yeah, I know you, 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 you do coaching. Uh, do you, you want to shout out anything for the people and if you're coaching stuff, your Instagram, any of that? Oh, so, um, if anybody's interested in online coaching or if you're in the U S especially in California, uh, you can hit me up. I'm here to coach you. I can tell you, I can share a lot of knowledge about the planche because it's not as simple. And even this, I don't know, it's like almost 50 minutes of the podcast. It's, it's still covering a very small aspect of the planche. So if you're interested in learning more about the planche, just hit me up. It's Mr. Wong underscore SW on Instagram. So just shoot me a text. I respond to everybody eventually within three days. Yeah. Instagram's a bit crazy like that, but yeah, all yeah, the yeah. links will be down below. So you'll be able to find his page. Yeah. Just send him a DM. Yeah. Mark is super helpful and so knowledgeable. I've had some friends that have worked with him and you know, not, not one bad thing. It, it was only smiles and, and laughs on the calls that I saw when he was, co when you were coaching him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Again, thank you so much for your time. Um, yeah, I, I'll probably, you know, have some kind of video I want to do soon um, or just talk more about the plants because there's so much we didn't talk about mm -hmm. um, that I did want to ask, but we only have so much time. But yeah, thanks again, man. Of course, man. It's my pleasure sharing the knowledge and the vibes. It's good to spread the knowledge because right now, calisthenics is growing and there's not much knowledge out there. So I'm trying to like make sure everybody learns, everybody understands and overall elevate the sport, man. Let's go. <laughs> Yeah, let's go guys. Okay guys, that's it for today and yeah, we'll see you guys in the next one. Alright, peace out guys.